report. Welcome everyone to another session of the data learn learning seminars. Today we have Soledad Villar from uh, John Hop Hopkins University. She completed her PhD in mathematics in UT Austin. And after that, she did a postdoc in NYU. Um, Soledad, thank you for your participation today. And like, um, yeah, I'll leave the audience with you. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, please ask questions. If you have some questions during the talk, I like to make me to make it a little bit interactive if possible. So yeah. So uh, I'm going to talk about equivariant machine learning using classical physics. And I'm going to define but what equivariant machine learning is. But um, uh, first, I'm going to start with a motivation. And the motivation is in the context of deep learning, which is something that you may be very familiar with. The idea is that in deep learning, we use uh, very over-parameterized models. So we have way more parameters than data points. And uh, so there are many functions that are in the hypothesis class that can fit the data perfectly. So the question is, how do you choose the right one? How do you choose the right architecture or the right hypothesis class so that when you do stochastic gradient descent, you converge to a good solution. And with a good solution, I mean a solution that generalizes well on data that it hasn't seen before. Um, so define, defining the hypothesis class with the correct inductive bias, it, it means that. It means that uh, we want to find a class of functions and parameterize it in a way so that when we do local optimizations, we converge to a good solution. So how do you do that? And so in, in machine learning, in deep learning, there are many classes of architectures that people have uh, uh, found that actually have the correct inductive bias and that they perform well in many problems, in particular convolution neural networks. Uh, for example, recurrent neural networks um, were used uh, a lot before now transformers took over. And then there's graph neural networks as well. Those are the examples that I'm going to focus on as like ar um, architectures that have inductive bias, or good inductive bias. And we can note that all these architectures exploit some form of symmetry in the space. So for instance, convolutional neural networks exploit trans the, their translation equivariant. So it doesn't matter where in the image you, you have your relevant things, you can still find it. Um, recurrent neural networks also lo look at some time translation symmetry and graph neural networks have the property that are um, that learn functions on a graph so here this is a graph uh, that you can that it, it's, it doesn't matter how you represent this graph as an adjacency matrix what ordering do you give to the nodes uh, when you write this graph as a matrix uh, you have many choices, which is the different ways you can order the nodes in the adjacency matrix. And the graph neural networks are going to learn a function that is independent of that node relabeling. And that is some form of equivalence as well, some form of symmetry. And, and I'm going to explain that more in detail later. Um, in the physical sciences, we also have some symmetries that are very relevant. Um, we can identify two types of symmetries in the physics literature. The, the, there's the active symmetries that are symmetries that are, come from observed regularities of the physics and have to do with conservation laws according to Noether theorem. So Noether theorem says that if you have a physical system uh, that has some uh, continuous symmetry, then that symmetry translates into a conservation law. So for instance, a symmetry that conserves energy has a time translation symmetry. So it doesn't matter whether I observe the symmetry today or tomorrow, if the state is the same, then the, the prediction should be the same. Uh, other types of symmetries like the translation symmetry corresponds to conservation of momentum and rotation symmetry corresponds to conservation of angular momentum. And all these, um, all these symmetries are things that we can observe from the, from the physical system by just making observations. Um, other symmetries that are relevant, very relevant for physics are uh, symmetries that are called passive symmetries. There are symmetries that come from the choices of mathematical uh, objects that I use to represent the physical system. So for instance, if I have a system 
and I represented with objects, and these objects have units, like for instance, positions have units of meters, and velocities have units of meters per second. If I change the the, the unit system that I use in, to represent the physics, uh, the physics doesn't know, it doesn't care what, what units I'm using. So there is some sort of uh, coordinate transformation that should apply to the physical system when I see it in different coordinates. And that you can write it as a symmetry. Other symmetries that, well, related symmetries are coordinate freedoms and uh, gauge invariances or equivalences. And the claim is that, and these symmetries, by the way, are very related to the symmetries of graph neural networks. So if, like, if I represent the same graph differently, then the observation shouldn't change. The same thing with the physical system. If I represent the same physical system with a different set of mathematical objects, like the, the prediction should be consistent to a change in the mathematical objects. And the claim of equivalent machine learning and the claim that we wanna to make today is that machine learning and data science models should be consistent with the symmetry, should, should be kind of like agnostic to the representation choices or aware of the symmetries of the system. And that would give us better models. That would give us models that have a better generalization error or you can learn uh, with fewer samples, like better sample complexity and things like that. So that's a claim. And another motivation of this, of this, uh, of this problem uh, is that there is like, in physics, people think about these, these symmetries and people think about like coordinate freedom and they use that to represent their objects. Uh, so for instance, uh, this, is, this modern classical physics book by Thorne and Blanford in the first page of the, fir in the first uh, sentence of the first page, says this, says that the laws of physics must be expressible as coordinate independent and reference frame independent geometric objects and the relationship between these geometric objects. And I think that this is a good way to formalize the machine learning models that we use in the physical sciences. And so I'm gonna show you how we do that. Uh, so before that, I'm going to define what I mean with equivalence and invariance. And basically this refers to exact symmetries. Um, the idea is the following. So say that I have a data set where I'm going to make my predictions. Um, uh, maybe I have a group acting on that data set. For example, here, this simple example, I have images and the group that acts on the images is this grid rotation. So rotations by 90 degrees and maybe reflections if you want. And so we say that a function f from x to y is invariant if when I apply a group transformation to the input, the output doesn't change. So for instance, here we have this classifier that classify all these images as rows. And if I apply a discrete rotation to the images, the classification value, which is rows, doesn't change. Um, we also say equivalence, uh, define equivalence uh, when we have a group acting on the output space as well. And then a, a function is equivalent if every time that you apply a transformation uh, to the input, then the output uh, transforms in the same way or by the same group action. So here is like, it doesn't change. And here is it transforms by the same group action. And so example, see, imagine this particle simulation. So we have these particles and then we predict how these particles will look after say certain amount of time. And so if I apply a rotation to the input, then the output should rotate in the same way. That's basically the example. So what does equivalent machine learning do? Basically what it does is this, it parametrizes the space of functions uh, so that for every choice of parameters that define my neural network or whatever function I'm using, the F theta is going to be equivalent or invariant. So for every choice of parameters, the class of functions uh, or, the, or the function that you obtain for that parameter, it has the symmetries that the physical system has. So then when you do machine learning, you all will only can converge to a function that satisfies the symmetries. And therefore uh, you reduce the dimensionality of the space and have something that has like the correct physical model, always has the correct physical model. So the question is how, we do, do, how do we do that? And, and how can we analyze models in this, in this space? So uh, the applications of 
um, of like we learning machine learning include um, like like images or like you can think of it as vector fields or tensor fields that model something like for instance fluid dynamics that incorporates many symmetries. The graph neural networks also have the symmetry with respect of like how do you express um, a graph as a matrix and there's not a unique choice and that comes with the symmetry. And then particle systems, uh, for instance, in this example, there's many papers that analyze um, the, or like that model, uh, for instance, protein folding or different uh, particle simulations that incorporate like equivariant uh, modules like equivariant transformers. And so um, in this talk, I'm gonna explain or maybe I'm gonna do a subset of this, how to implement equivariant models on particle systems, uh, how to implement equivariant functions on scalar vector and tensor images. And I have a few applications. I have an application, which is a toy example that may be very related with the things that you do at this group uh, because it is like, a, like a, a dynamical system, like a toy dynamical system that we can implement with the symmetries, like a double pendulum with springs. And there's a cosmology application with a cosmology David Hogg at NYU. And there's the vegetation dynamics uh, example that we do with Bianca Dumitrascu, who is in Cambridge right now. Um, so first, I just want to describe like a few lines of work of how symmetries are implemented. So the, the Typical way of doing this in machine learning is via data augmentation. So basically you, you take your data set and you augment it with the transform uh, data points of your training according to the group action. And then you transform the labels according to whatever they should be uh, according to this uh, invariance or equivariance. And so you, you can add that and then make the training with this like transform training set and you can analyze that if you do that, you don't really make sure that you incorporate the symmetries, but you see that you can reduce the, the covariance of the estimators, for instance. Um, another thing that you can do is uh, you can exploit the fact that these uh, symmetries are related with the conservation loss to put this, like, if you know what the conserved quantity should be, you can put that as a, as a loss function, as a as a, in the penalization, as a penalization in the objective. Uh, but the thing that I'm going to focus on today is how do we restrict the class of functions so that the, every function in the class satisfies the symmetries. And there's a lot of work in this space. You should check out work by Taco Cohen, who did this in his PhD thesis. He studied um, equivalent convolutions and other forms of message passing to implement this. Uh, there's other papers that do it in terms of irreducible representations. Um, like you can look up uh, Cohen, uh, Condor, and Welling. Um, there's a very nice paper that does it with constraints. And I'm going to focus on my work that does it with invariant theory. So I'm going to just give an overview of some of these methods. Um, so, okay. So one way of doing this is via defining equivalent architectures. And if you're familiar with like the classical feed forward neural network, then uh, it would be like uh, something to keep in mind in the back of your mind. So the idea is that in a feed forward architecture, um, you have some linear layers uh, composed with nonlinear activation functions. So you start, you start with your input, you apply a linear layer, you apply a nonlinear activation function, you apply a nonlinear layer, et cetera. So that's basically like the classical architecture neural network from like the 90s. And so the idea that Condor and Maron had was to uh, take these linear layers and replace them by linear layers that are also equivalent. So basically that satisfy this group constraint. Like if I apply a group action to the input, then the action is applied to the output as well. The issue with that is that when you make when you add this constraint to the linear layers, then um, you lose a lot of functions. Like basically, this is like super restrictive. So you don't have many functions that you can express in these terms. So then, what they say is actually 
what we are going to do is we're going to extend this action to tensors. And instead of working on just vectors, I'm going to uh, apply this model to take tensor inputs. So tensorize my, maybe my input vector, take, make it a tensor of this vector with itself k times. And then say that at each layer, instead of having one vector, I have a tensor, which is very easily implementable with the, with the machine, with the like um, PyTorch and TensorFlow. And so what you can do is now, instead of having a linear function on vectors that is equivalent, I have a linear function on tensors that should be equivalent. And in order to do that, they have to extend the action that they have by the group to tensors. And so if this is a tensor and then Q was a group element, the way Q acts on this tensor is by acting in each of the vectors and taking the tensor product of the, of the result. And so, and so then the question is, uh, how do we parameterize uh, the equivalent functions on these tensors? And how do we, um, how do we choose the compatible activation functions? And so this is a line of research uh, and there's a lot of uh, work in this space. And basically the way they do it is by using representation theory. And in order to do that, what they have to do is they have to take this space and decompose it in terms of the cleft score and coefficients and use uh, something like called Schorr's lemma to parameterize the space of equivalent functions. Uh, is that something that you have seen before or like is that something that um, interests you or you want to see? I can go into the details of that, but maybe I kind of skip the details and leave it to the end for questions if you want to see more details on this implementation. There's many nice papers explaining how these architectures work. Um, and the, the nice thing about these architectures is that this idea of using these reducible representations can work for any group that you want. Like you can write it for any group. The thing that you, that, that you need to do is you need to be able to decompose these in terms of the reducible representations, which may be a little bit complicated if you are just working for any group, but in, in theory it can be done. So that's a very nice um, framework. And it's a natural extension of the classical field forward neural network. Um, so, the other approach that I wanted to discuss is uh, how we use it, how do we do it? How do we parameterize the space of equivalent functions instead of using these reducible representations which require the knowledge of a little bit of algebra and also some, sometimes it's hard to compute by using classical invariant theory. And uh, this is some work that we did with collaborators a couple of years ago and then last year, I think. And then the idea is that um, um, this gives you a very nice parametrization of the space, but it only works for a specific set of groups that are relevant for classical physics. So uh, the other approach can work in general, uh, but it's complicated. This one is simpler, but uh, it only works on like classical physics kind of groups. And so the idea is the following. Say that we have this uh, particle system right here. And so we have n particles in R3 in this example. So say n particles in Rd. And the goal is to find, uh, parameterize all invariant functions from this particle system to a scalar. So for instance, say we want to predict the energy of this system, for example. So, um, so we can say parameterize the functions that are uh, invariant with respect to o OD, which is the orthogonal uh, orthogonal group on on dimension D, which is basically the the transformations of R D that fix the origin and preserve distances. Uh, so basically, rotations and reflections. That's O D. Um, or we can just forget about the reflections and just use rotations. Or if we are if we're working on some physics constants, we may want to look, to look at the Lorentz transformations, which are the isometries in space time. And so what we want to do is we want to find the invariant functions. So basically say that uh, 
the group, like if you have a rotation or like an orthogonal transformation applied to each of the, my vectors in my input, the output doesn't change. So say I have this particle system and then I rotate it, like then the energy doesn't change. Okay. I have to rotate all the vectors together. Um, so, so the question is, how do you parameterize all the functions to satisfy this property? And so we can go back to uh, the, the 20th century and look at the first fundamental theorem for invariant theory that tells you that a function that takes n vectors in RD to R is OD invariant, so invariant with respect to this isometry that takes the origin, if and only if uh, is a function of the inner product of the input vectors. So uh, the idea is that, so we take the n vectors in RD, we construct the features, which are going to be the pairwise inner products of these n vectors in RD, and then any function from this n vectors in RD that is invariant with respect to rotations can be factored through this feature map. So it can be written as F tilde of this. So I guess that this here should have been F tilde just to be consistent with the notation. Yeah. So this that I just said here, maybe uh, um, you can, I mean, it's, it's kind of one direction is obvious, right? Like if I, if I have a function of, of uh, the inner products, uh, that function is going to be invariant with respect to rotations. Because if I take my vectors, I take the inner products, uh, if I rotate everything, the inner products don't change. So the, the maybe not so trivial part of the, of the argument is that every function that is invariant can be written in terms of the inner products. So that's, that's uh, the first fundamental theorem of invariant theory. And other uh, similar characterizations can be written for, for the Lorentz groups, for rotations, and for symplectic group and unitary groups. Just to say a few, just simply groups, uh, like the invariants for these groups are, are known. Um, and so after we know that, we can use these ideas to, uh, to parameterize all the equivariant vector functions. So the idea is that uh, if you have a function that takes some vectors in RD and outputs a vector in RD, uh, this function is OD equivariant, if and only if you can write it as a linear combination of your input vectors where the coefficient functions are OD invariant scalar functions. So functions of the inner products as we, as we saw before. Uh, so you can think of it as like, say that for each of the, you, if you want to do a, a, a prediction of, of this particle simulation, then for each particle, you can say, well, the function of when this particle is going to be after a certain amount of time, that is an equivalent function of the entire system. So if I rotate the entire system, the position of that particle rotates in the same way. And so you can learn any independent functions of this form and then just do the particle simulation with that, basically. Um, and, so, uh, and so the question is, well, if you parameterize the space of functions using this model, then every function that you obtain is going to be equivariant and every function that is equivalent can be explained, can be expressed in terms of this model because this model is universal. So, um, so the model would be the following. You take your input vectors and vectors in RD, you compute the scalar products, which is the inner, like the features, the, the inner products of the input vectors. And then you learn this F1 through Fn. You can use an MLP or you can use whatever you want. These are going to be functions, uh, any functions that take these scalar products and output a, a, a scalar. And then the output is going to be the corresponding linear combination. Just I, I wrote it this form, just like you aggregate in this function using this form. And so this, for instance, you can implement it easily as equivalent self-attention. Um, and uh, we have a paper on that in the machine learning for physics workshop at the university this year. Um, I, okay, so that's it. And then this can be uh, generalized to other groups. I just gave you the example of how it works for the OD because it's the simplest thing to write. 
But then, for instance, if we look at just rotations, not rotations and reflection, then it looks very similar, but the, you have some extra terms that show up in the characterization. And the idea is that in, in, the, in the example before, we had that every, any equivalent function needed to be uh, in the span of the inputs. But when you look at rotations, that's not true. So for instance, you can have, like if you if you think from your physics class, you remember this like right-hand rule, uh, you can take A and B and then the cross product of A and B uh, is, an, is going to be an equivalent function of A and B and it's not in the span of A and B. So for instance, uh, if I rotate my hand, then this thing rotates and the other finger rotates in the same way. And this function is rotation equivalent but it's not OD equivalent because it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not equivalent with respect to reflections, right? Anyway, so then these can be generalized using uh, the SOD invariant scalars we are, that are a little bit more than the scalar products and the generalized cross products that look like this, but also in higher dimensions. Um, but basically, this is a complete characterization, and it works for other um, for other groups as well. And so, there is a, a nice general theory in the in the invariant theory um, literature that can explain how you can go from invariants to equivalent functions, and that's something that that we wrote with my postdoc Ben Bloom Smith, who is an invariant theorist. We wrote a short note explaining how we can use this general theory in the context of equivalent machine learning. And so the idea is that, um, like, if you have an action on a on a space V and, and an action in space W, that in, induces an action on the maps from V to W. Uh, and then the idea is that. Uh, the, the equivalent functions uh, from B to W are going to be the fixed points of the action of the group on the space of maps. And so the knowledge of invariant maps from, uh, from uh, B times the dual of W to R can give you the knowledge of the equivalent maps from B to W. So understanding, maybe you can think of it as understanding invariant functions on copies of the space and maybe the space on the dual uh, would give you knowledge of the invariance on the, on the space of maps. The, uh, sorry, on the, the understanding the invariance in this space would give you knowledge of the equivariant maps in this space. And there's an algorithm that you can write whatever we did here and here from going from the invariance to equivariance, you can write it in, more, in, in largest generality, basically. That's the that's the point. So these ideas can also be generalized or like not generalized, but like can be applied to other uh, other things that may be useful. For instance, if you want to not just rotations, but also rotations and, and translations, like the Euclidean group, that's very easy to incorporate to this model. Trans, like translation equivalence or translation invariance is very easy to implement by just looking, for instance, at distances of, uh, of input vectors or just maybe subtract the center of mass and then add it in the end. That's not an issue. Uh, something maybe something that you may be interested in is that uh, you can consider uh, permutation invariance as well. And so the idea is that. Um, so say that we have this particle simulation. And so uh, when you want to predict the position of a particle, then the position of that particle uh, in after a certain amount of time, uh, only it's not, I mean, it's a function of the entire system, but it's a function of the set of points. Not, it doesn't matter the order I give the points. All the points are kind of like exchangeable in this space. So, so then that can be formulated as a specific equivalence, uh, sorry, as, as a specific invariance. And you can extend this model to, um, to express that. And so the idea is that if I have a function H of V1 to Vn, that is a function of uh, the 
when I apply a permutation to my inputs, then the function doesn't change. So basically it's a permutation invariant function. Then this function h can be written as a linear combination. And then uh, the, of the input vectors as before. Uh, and so the function that is using for this linear combination is the same function uh, that in, for all the coefficients, but is a function of the, the guy that is multiplying by and then everything else as a set. Uh, it, it's like a little bit uh, complicated to, to explain, but basically the idea is like, okay, the thing that, that, that multiplies the i is a function of the i and everything else. So as I said, so that is easy to implement as message passing. So if you were working on graphing networks, then that's one of the applications, like one way you can implement this model, for instance. Yeah. Um, so now that I show you how the model looks like, I'm gonna explain uh, a very simple example. And um, the idea is the following. Uh, so this is, this, this uh, most of the implementations of the, of, the, of the models that I'm showing today uh, have been done by Wei Chi Yao. She's a PhD student at NYU. I met her when I was a postdoc at NYU and she is uh, finishing her PhD right now and she is applying for postdocs. So if that's something that would interest you, let, let me know and I'll put you in contact. Um, so, okay. So it's my advertisement for my talk. Uh, so I'm gonna explain this double pendulum example with, with Spring. So the idea is the following. Um, so we have these, these two masses connected by springs. And this is a toy example. Uh, this is a conserve, uh, this, the energy of the system is conserved. And the, the, basically the data is the position and momentum of these particles, uh, of these masses, the, the red mass and the yellow mass. And then the, there's also the masses, the lengths and the constants of the spring, but actually this I don't know. So the only thing that I know is this. And the problem is to predict the dynamics of the system. So, um, so this system is a, is a Hamiltonian system. So if I write the kinetic energy and the potential energy, this energy, uh, this gives me the Hamiltonian, the sum of these two things gives me the Hamiltonian, which is a conserved quantity, which is in, uh, in a correspondence with the time translation symmetry. So, um, so this system is symmetric with respect to rotations in the xy plane, but it's not symmetric with respect to rotations in the z axis um, because, well, I mean, the gravity changes like how the dynamics would be if I if I change the the, z, the if I do a rotation in the z axis. However, if I add the gravity vector as an input vector to my system, then uh, then I get a full O3 equivalence symmetry. And we can think of it as a passive symmetry. It's kind of like when, when I do this, when I rotate the gravity with everything else, it's kind of like a, like a change of coordinates that I'm doing. And this is, a, this is not an observed symmetry, but it's like a passive symmetry. Whereas this symmetry over here is an observed symmetry of the system that I can observe. So, Incorporating the gravity to the predictions uh, allows me to have a fully O3 equivalent system. And uh, the, we consider two computational approaches, and I know that you work in dynamical, uh, modeling dynamical systems, so uh, I'm sure that you know this better than me. But the models that we consider are this neural ODE model, which basically you learn uh, and a differential equation that is satisfied by the data. And basically what we say is, well, the differential equation should be equivariant with respect to rotation. So F, the function that parameterizes the differential equation is an equivariant function with respect to the symmetries of the system. And we implement it using the model that we have for equivariant functions, which is this one. And so we learn the differential equation and then we make the predictions using an ODE integrator, and then we 
we com we express the loss function as like what are these predictions different from the data that we have. Um, the other model that we use is a Hamiltonian neural network, which I think is like the basically expressed here. So the idea is that we can use the fact that we know that this model is Hamiltonian and therefore uh, use this is kind of like another symmetry that we can incorporate. And we can use, uh, we can learn a Hamiltonian, which is just a scalar function. And this, and then we can integrate the Hamiltonian using a symplectic integrator, just because we know that if the system is Hamiltonian, then it obeys a specific differential equation. So we don't really need to learn the entire differential equation as we did with the neural ODE, but we need to learn a specific differential equation and we integrate it as we already know how to do it using a, a Hamiltonian, uh, a symplectic integrator. And the result is what you would expect. So um, this toy example shows you like what you would expect is the more symmetries that you impose to your system, uh, the, the error becomes smaller. So from here to here in this direction, you have here is no symmetries, and here there are like small discrete groups. This is the rotation with respect to the, X, the XY plane. This, this is re, re, uh, rotation and reflection, and these are just the, the full O3 symmetry. And then this is the neural ODEs, which don't incorporate the Hamiltonian symmetry, and these are the Hamiltonian, uh, Hamiltonian neural networks, which incorporate the, the, the symmetry. And you, Roughly what happens is like the more symmetries that you have, uh, the smallest error. And this is a model that has the most amount of symmetries and is the one that has the smallest error. So that is consistent with the story that I wanted to tell you. So um, another extension to this model is um, regarding like, you can think of other symmetries that you can inco incorporate to this model. And we have a paper where we're in archive that uh, that explains um, how to incorporate units equivalence to your physical models. So the idea, and just to set how um, it works in a specific example, in this double pendulum, we are predicting this Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian has units, is an energy. So it has units, kilogram meter squared divided by second square. So if I take my system, and I take that everything that has units of kilograms is going to be converted to pounds. And then, then it needs to be multiplied by two point something. No, divide by two point something. Then the multiply, sorry. Uh, then uh, then the, the prediction should have the same transformation done to it, right? And so that is a symmetry that you can incorporate to your model. And the way you can incorporate this model that is a symmetry with respect to, to rescalings is by doing the following approach. You take your input features, which are uh, masses and um, um, lengths and et cetera, all of them have units. And then you can construct a basis of dimensionless features by constructing features that cancel out these, uh, these units, and then learn a function of these dimensionless features and then rescale it back with a fixed scaling at the end. And this is going, if you, if you incorporate a model, if you do a model like this, this model is going to be equivalent with respect to units uh, scalings, and then incorporates another symmetry as well. And we can show that this implementation of this symmetry uh, gives us a better out of distribution generalization. Like you can learn in some regime, train in some regime and, and evaluate in a different regime and it works very well in comparison with not doing this, this unit scaling. So, um, so there are some applications. I'm not gonna go into these details because uh, I, I'm already almost out of time, but I just, I want to mention that I work with uh, David Hogg and Kate Story Fisher in applying these models to uh, predicting properties of galaxies from dark matter simulations. Um, 
There's, there's another application to vegetation dynamics with Bianca Dumitrascu. Uh, I, I'm happy to take questions about any of these at the end if you're interested. And uh, finally, I wanted to tell you that we are working on uh, 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 aggregating these ideas to, um, to define, to kind of like incorporate these ideas of the, of the vectors and, and tensors uh, to work on images as well. So basically the idea that we have like these uh, the geometric objects based, defined in terms of vectors and tensors, and we know how to write the equivariant functions using the fundamental theorem of invariant functions and invariant theory uh, to images on tensors and vectors. And, uh, and I can maybe just show you some and these have many applications in the physical sciences because in the physical sciences, we have uh, images that have vectors and tensors in each of the inputs as well, in each of the pixels as well. And just maybe I can just leave you with like some drawings of like how the models work. We use, uh, we use um, filters that have tensors and vectors and they're symmetric and we can, um, have some interpretation of these models as taking curls or taking sharpenings or diffusions of the initial images. So uh, we have interpretations of these filters from like a physical point of view. And, um, and finally, I'm just gonna summarize, say that we believe that enforcing exact images in machine learning is the right thing to do because it gives us the correct models assumptions it gives a small, a small sample complexity and small generalization error, and you can also generalize out of distribution. Um, the symmetries in classical physics can be separated in active and passive symmetries, and there's a simple characterization of all equivariant functions with respect to physically relevant group actions based on this Einstein summation notation that I didn't define, but basically it's classical invariant theory, and uh, we extend this to units equivalence. And we have a, an, um, an explicit translation between invariance and equivalence using invariant theory. And we can extend this to images as well. And we're working on that. So these are my references and the funding that I have. And please uh, ask questions if you, if you have any. Thank you, Soledad. That's a very informative um, review, overview of what you've been doing and also of equivariant machine learning. Um, if you have any questions, just type them on the chat. If otherwise, you can unmute yourself or raise your hand, and I'll um, mm -hmm. you can share your question. So let me check the chat. Um, um, Do you want to yeah, stop but... the recording or? No, I just go ahead to to include the the questions. Oh, there's a question in the chat. It says it will be interesting to see more on the score than the composition you were referring to earlier. Yeah, so I can I can say that there is uh okay so maybe I can show you the the slide that I skipped. So the the idea is that uh, an equivalent map, a linear equivalent map between two uh, vector spaces. Uh, you can see it as a map between the representations of these spaces. And so the idea is that if you have this tensor representation that is like basically a tensor product of the, uh, uh, like, yeah, so a representation on a, on a tensor product of, of these vector spaces, so RD to the K tensor. So then you can, you can, you should like be able to, uh, to decompose this, this tensor product in terms of the reducible representations of the space. Uh, the way you do this decomposition of the tensor uh, representation in terms of the reducible is by an identification that is given by the cleft gordon coefficients. So that's the same identification that you use to look, for instance, at the product of two spherical harmonics in terms of an spherical harmonic, for instance, it's the same the same computation that you do. How to and and then 
And then once that you have this decomposition in irreducibles, then there's something called Shor's lemma that tells you that if you have two irreducible representations of a vector space, then, uh, then a, ma a map between these two guys, these two irreducible representations is either the, a multiple of the identity or zero. So it's kind of like these irreducible representations give us like a, the building blocks that we need to write all the equivalent maps, like, right? So once that you write, your vector space in terms of irreducibles is kind of like a like a the composition of a number in primes, and then these uh, these building blocks, which are the irreducible representations, this the determine what are the equivalent map because you can only map two irreducible representations by a multiple of the identity, or they are not they, there's no equivalent map. So basically, when you do that, uh, when you do this decomposition. Then, if you have two spaces, you can do these two decompositions for these two spaces. Look at the rules of representations in both things, and then just if they are isomorphic, then you can map them, and if they are not isomorphic, then you cannot map them. And that's basically just how you define the equivalent linear maps. So the the question is like, how do you do this decomposition? And this is where the Klebsch Gordon coefficient show up. And so, for instance, there's a paper, and I suggest you look at. Tess Smith, well, it's here. This, she has more papers than that, but like one of the first papers that actually did an implementation of this, the first authors are Thomas and Smith, and they have a software package, package I think, in TensorFlow that implements uh, these for SO3 using this Klebsch code and the composition. Yeah. Does that, this does, does that answer your question? Do you have more questions about it? Yeah, uh, yeah, and you can check out the the, the paper by, by Tess, the recent paper by Tess. She she explains uh, how to do that specifically. Thank you, Edward. Uh, thank you, Soledad, as well. Um, let me see the time. Yeah. Um, any other questions from the audience? Otherwise, um, I have a question in terms of um, scaling these um, approaches because. Uh, with the models that we work usually, uh, the CFDs, it could have like hundreds of thousands of points, and that could be a, represented as a graph, for example. Um, how to how is it is it easy easy to scale these um, approaches to a large number yeah. of nodes? So um, that's a that's a great question, and I think that, for instance, for this model that we described here, like when you have your input are n vectors in rd the scalars are n square uh, inner products so you're thinking okay this model is not going to scale because it's n square but actually uh, if you look at the matrix completion theory uh, it tells you that like well, you can actually recover the the inner products from a subset of the scalars. You can reconstruct the entire matrix from the subset of the scalars. The idea is that if you have like M, no, sorry, you have B is a vector of inner products. So B1, uh, so it's a vector, it's a matrix with the vectors, right? So then M is B transpose B. This is a matrix of inner products. And so if you take M, this is an N by N matrix. Uh, you can just take a subset of the inner products, like look like this, and that subset, since this is a low rank matrix, this is an N by N matrix in our, but of this is like in uh, uh, D by N. So this is a matrix of rank D. If you take a uh, order of, uh, D plus one times K uh, is uh, uh, D, D plus one times N inner products, that allows you to reconstruct the entire matrix. So you don't really need to use all the inner products in order to, uh, you don't, yeah, you don't need to use the, all the scalar products. You can just make a subset of the scalar products and that subset would be uniquely determined determining all the inner products and then you can use that 
to write your learning function. You don't even need to be able to reconstruct all, all the inner products. So you can just write a subset that uniquely determines and then learn a function on that. And I think that it's a nice problem to identify what are the error rates of using, instead of using all the inner products to use a subset of the inner products. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because so often, that, often like the data sets can be quite sparse as well. So maybe just like the, um, yeah. especially with the mesh it will refine around the actual problem you want to solve. And maybe that's the only area that you're interested in. The rest could be just like all zeros, for example. So yeah. Uh, and so for instance, in this example here, where you have like, well, you can write this as a graph in a network. Like the the for this point, the the like the prediction for this point over here is a function of everything else. But what you could do is you can say, well, I only care about a, uh, like a small region of it, and then the things outside have a smaller influence. So there's you, something that you could do is you can use the ideas that decompose this space, like the fast multiple methods that decompose this space on like the things that are close to a point are, um, are, are like in a very high resolution, but the things that are farther away are aggregated at lower resolutions. And you can use that for implementing this model. I know that there is a paper that this do like these uh, fast multiple methods with GNNs. They're, the authors are Stanley Osher and others. And they, yeah, they actually propose that. And I imagine that they have some software that implements it. It's a little bit complicated because if you have seen like the fast multiple methods papers, they are not very easy to implement because you have to do, have like this decomposition of the space. And then when you do the dynamics, the decomposition of the space must change because things that were farther apart, now they become closer together. So. It isn't clear to me how to do it in an efficient way, uh, but but it has been done. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely have a look at that. Actually, we're working on a ocean application where, like, maybe points very far away are not connected to the point of interest. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have a look at it. Um, yeah. yeah, they have another question from Edward. Uh, can you? So I, I say that my work on OD invariant functions came from a fundamental theorem for the group. Then said that it works for a number of other groups. Is that because they also have fundamental theorems? Yes, they do. And I have, I didn't show that, but they do have other fundamental theorems and I can show that here. So for instance, the fundamental theorem of OD says that a function that is, in, is invariant is a function of the inner product of the, of the input vectors. The fundamental theorem for SOD, which is rotations without the reflections, says that a function that is invariant is a function of the inner products and the, the D by D sub the determinants of this B, the matrix of vectors. So, so here say that if you have your vectors, like as I had before, B1 to Bn. So, I can take D by D sub determinants of this matrix and that, uh, so for instance, it will look like this. Like all these D by D sub matrices that I can write here. And these are going to be invariant functions as well. So that's why, so say you have a group, the orthogonal group, it's a big group. Inside the orthogonal group, uh, you have the special orthogonal group with our rotations. So the invariants for the smaller group are going to be larger than a larger set than the invariants for the smaller group. Sorry, than the invariants for the bigger group, right? Like you have a correspondence, like if, if like uh, G is included in G prime, then the invariant functions for G or K of X, whoops say the invariant polynomials, like let's call it the invariant polynomials just for simplicity. The invariant polynomials uh, for G are going to be uh, a subset of the invariant polynomials for G prime, just like, because you need, uh, if you're bigger, you fix less things than if you are smaller, right? So then what happens is that here, when you look at SOD, you have the same invariants that you had before, plus new things that show up. 
that come from the fact that the SOD is smaller. And then the, the Lorentz group, that's an, an interesting example. So the Lorentz group is kind of like the OD group, uh, but these are the isometries in space time. So there's like a, this Lorentz transformation that take the time direction is different than the space direction. And the, the invariant, uh, the fundamental theorem for invariant function for the Lorentz group says that uh, a function is invariant if and only if you can write it in terms of these Minkowski inner products. And so if you have a point in that has time components uh, and space components, uh, and another point with this time component and space component, this inner product would take the product of the time components minus the inner product of the space components. And these are going to be the inner products that you use for parameterizing the invariant functions for the Lorentz group. And similar things you can do for other simple groups if you, if you know what are the fundamental invariants. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Edward. Um, well, it's past five. Actually, I was thinking if you can spend like, if you have time to like share the applications of like the galaxy or the vegetation dynamics, you like very, okay. yep. If that's Briefly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm not, I, honestly, I'm not the expert on this. So I can just, uh, yeah, I can tell you, uh, I can tell you how it works, but I'm not the, the expert. So the idea yeah. is, uh, the idea is the following. So. There is this, uh, this um, cosmolo cosmology simulations uh, for uh, the formation of the universe. And so there's two types of simulations that they use. There's this dark matter only simulations that only use gravity. And there's this uh, hydrodynamic simulation that use more complicated models that include uh, like, gases and how they interact and other other things that make it that is way more expensive. So we can think that these are like the cheap simulations and these one are the expensive simulations. And so what they want to do is they want to be able to predict uh, what would the expensive simulation will have given you by only running the cheap simulation. So basically they have, the input is their dark matter simulation and they want to predict the properties of galaxies uh, that the hydrodynamic simulation would have given them. And so they say, well, if that's possible to do, then whatever prediction model we use need to be consistent with the synergies of the problem. So, so then what they do is they have this dark matter simulation and they, decompose the space, and this is like a particle simulation with a lot of particles. And then they decompose the space in some bins, like different uh, like areas of the simulation. And they, it kind of like a multiple decomposition, like at different scales. And then for each of these bins, they compute uh, dimensional scalars that have to do with, um, that, that they can compute as like tensors, tensor products or tensors or higher dimensional objects or vectors. And each of them, so for instance, if you have like your particles here and you take a tensor product with different particles, then uh, you have a matrix. And then from those matrices, you can compute the eigenvectors or eigenvalues, and those functions are going to be invariant. And, uh, and also they, they normalize them so that they're also dimensionless. So with that, for each of these bins, they compute a set of features that are dimensionless and are also equivalent with respect to the rotations of the system. And they make their predictions based on that. So basically you can think of it as like uh, a feature extraction that is consistent with the physics. And so these are the features that they obtain with this. They say, well, they have like 500 or so features and then they do a regression model as the ones that they do in this, in, in, in this uh, area. But instead of using the original features that are not dimension, like they're not geometric, they use these, these features. And then they, they, these are some preliminary results. This paper has not been published yet, but 
is well has not been we haven't finished write, writing it actually but basically preliminary they show that when you use these geometric features that preserve the symmetries, the predictions are significantly better. Like they have a 15% improvement over the baseline that they were working on before. Yeah, sounds, yeah, sounds, sounds great. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think, yeah, it's just six plus five. So I think we can leave it up to here. That's okay. Okay. Yep. yep. Um, thank you, Soledad, so much for sharing your time and giving us an overview of like your work. And yeah, thank you everyone for attending this uh, seminar series. Thanks. See you. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks.